I'm excited to talk about a local issue that went global. I think the important thing to think about these days is that no measure of conservation or environmental justice or making a sustainable planet can happen if we just stay home. We've got to help the whole world. And these are a few examples of how we're trying to use local examples in a global way. And I'm really excited to talk about a new program that had its birth in Sarasota. Um, a lot of us, of course, were geek children. I know, as I saw some of the people in the chat room, that you know, those of us who played outdoors as kids grew up and became these environmental, uh, passionate uh, action people. But I think it's exciting and important to think about bringing all kids outdoors now, our grandchildren, our children, whatever. This is me embarrassing to say in a, as a fifth grader with my little science fair project. But um, I think today, as I look back upon that, most embarrassing photo that I hope every kid gets a chance to collect a wildflower and press it in some way. Um, we did have some major advancements of this new science called canopy biology here in Sarasota. When I was the director of Selby Gardens, we hosted the first two international conferences. We even brought that apparatus in the top right, the inflatables, and displayed them at the garden. And of course, we have had the first ever public canopy walkway out in our beloved Mayaka River State Park. So why is this important? Well, holy cow, you know, we developed scuba in the 1950s and aquanauts explored undersea. We went to the moon in the 1960s and astronauts started their research but it wasn't until the 1980s that we actually went up a tree in our backyards virtually and um, lo and behold found out that 50% of the world's species on land live up there. So we're still really playing catch up with this very new science and uh, Florida is no exception. The tropics are extraordinary because they provide medicines and foods and timbers for so many, many people, but we have so much to learn in this habitat and so little time to protect it. And that's part of the real challenge. So again, um, I just published a book about all this, but I think it's exciting to think about this short timeline and try to figure out what can we do as citizens? How can we all help protect trees, find out more about trees and share trees with children? And again, using canopy walkways is one example. You'll see me there with the first public canopy walkway that I helped develop in Australia, um, along with construction cranes and all sorts of crazy things for research. Uh, the first real canopy walkway in North America was up in Williams College, but it wasn't public. Um, and we had inflatables. And then we had our beloved Mayaka built in the year 2000 by an amazing team of all kinds of wonderful downtown association, Selby Gardens, uh, Selby Foundation, Betty Schoenbaum, and some other wonderful supporters along the way that made this possible. And today it's a really important feature of our community. And the Tree Foundation was the instrument for that construction. And my book called The Arbornaut, which just came out last month, talks about this whole development of trees and forests and unfortunately the problems we have while as we cut them down and what we need to do to fix it. So I hope you'll share this with a girl as well as a boy. I am the mother of two boys and I think that um, we need more boys in science as well as girls. In fact, there's a real shortage out there of field biologists right now, and especially in the canopy where we have all of these undiscovered species and need them to be understood, studied, classified, and hopefully conserved. Um, so in my book, as well as in my career, I want to give you a couple take home messages. One is, as I already mentioned, we need to take kids outdoors and give them a sense of what nature is all about. It's fantastic to give them injections and medications and fresh water and schools and all those important things. But if there's no nature left, um, there won't be any schools and there sure won't be any human life on this planet. So we need to develop these young stewards of natural resources in order to ensure their future. Uh, those kids on the right, by the way, found a new species of insect in the uh, Mayaka River State Park canopy walkway where they're pictured there. And guess what? They got to be published scientists at the age of 10. So kids can do amazing things if we give them just a little ability to explore nature. 
Uh, I also did talk a bit about my book, The uh, Challenges of Being a Woman in Science. There have been hurdles along the way. I call it the glass canopy instead of the glass ceiling. And uh, I take a lot of solace by studying fig trees because they're these amazing strategic growing species. I won't give you the details. You'll have to read the book. But I think we can learn so many lessons by studying trees and figuring out how they do so much. They're benevolent. They provide for others. They are incredibly wise and strategic in terms of their use of resources. And of course, they're one of the few things that can actually take sunlight and produce energy, which is very, very cool. Um, and thirdly, I want to just mention how important trees are to our economics. A lot of people don't put a dollar sign on trees, but maybe we should, especially in cities where all too often we see trees cut down for malls, trees cut down for any kind of construction, people expanding their houses or moving their driveways. And quite frankly, it's just like burning the Louvre when you cut a tree down. And I think we need to be a lot tougher and a lot stronger about protecting this extraordinarily expensive resource that's very, very hard to replace. A big tree takes probably decades, maybe even hundreds of years to grow back. And of course, replacing all of its biodiversity could take even longer, if at all. So here's the challenge in my lifetime. And for any of you who are baby boomers, we have lost half of our primary forests during our lifetime, despite our efforts, despite our absolutely great research from universities like Florida, and even places like Harvard and Stanford, we are losing these forests rapidly and uh, exceeding a tipping point beyond which perhaps some species will become extinct and others will be unable to be replaced. So in a sense, it's like losing a very precious library. So just last year, uh, the Tree Foundation launched a new global project. I'm really excited because we have to provide hope to our young people and it's important enough that I spent the whole last chapter of my book talking about it, but Mission Green is a new uh, innovative way to look at environmental justice, forest conservation, and student research and wrap them all into one big program. At least that's what we plan to do. Uh, the genesis of this is one of my wonderful mentors, E.O. Wilson at Harvard wrote this fabulous book called Half Earth. And over many lunch hours, we talked about the fact that he says we should protect 99% of biodiversity by saving half of the planet, and then maybe leave the other half of the planet for that one species called human beings. So given that split, how do we pick that half of the planet for 99% of those species? The easy way is to pick the places that have the most species. And in his book, Ed interviewed me and about 20 other scientists and came up with a list of about 10 forests that he feels are the most important to save. Uh, so we took that list and then we talked to Sylvia Earle, another wonderful mentor and local figure at times. Um, she has a cool program called Mission Blue, where she has created hope spots. She identifies high biodiversity places in the ocean and advocates for communities to conserve them. So we took this wonderful model of Sylvia's and created Mission Green. Sylvia and I wrote an op-ed in the Miami Herald for Earth Day last year and explained that Mission Green would hot find hotspots on land, comparing it to Sylvia's hope spots in the ocean. So with this proven conservation model of Sylvia's, with a board of world-class scientists and a lot of local on the ground interactions with indigenous people and scientists who have been working on the ground for decades. We're hoping to put this program together. And it's really, really important. I can't emphasize enough how important it is for all of us to work with local people, not go places and just say, oh, you need to save all those species, but absolutely have trusted partnerships. And I'll give an example of that in a minute. Um, so Mission Green has identified six sites in the world where we plan to build or have built canopy walkways 
to hire local people in the cases of emerging countries and hire especially women and families to work at these ecotourism opportunities. And thirdly, to bring students down to undertake uh, biodiversity research. So our pilot and most successful walkway to date is the Mayaka River State Park. It has attracted a half a million visitors a year, according to the park, and that translates into about $30 million of revenue for the region. So if we could do similar things for some of these emerging countries where women and families deserve sustainable income, then we will do a wonderful thing, which is causing stewardship for the forest by the local people. And so we've identified these important forests around the world where in some cases less than 5% of the primary forest is left, making it really, really critical to go in there and build a canopy walkway and create this safe zone with a canopy walkway and protect the genetic library. Um, so here's our beloved Mayaka. Maybe some of you haven't even been there, but if you haven't, you need to go visit and know that Mayaka is now very important on the international scale as a model for how other countries hope to invoke walkways for ecotourism and sustainable income. A case study in point of one of the countries where forests are so highly endangered is Ethiopia. I've been working here for over 10 years and you can see all of the subsistence agriculture in a country where there's no irrigation, no tractors, no advanced technologies, unfortunately, yet. And so as a result, the forests have shrunk and the last remaining forests are in the churchyard. There's the Coptic church in the middle and hence the word church forest as these little patches or remnants of forests. But the cattle get in and eat the trees and the seedlings. The farmers sometimes plow too close or the kids take the edge branches home for firewood. So we need to figure out how can we help this country save its amazing genetic library because all the pollinators and birds and native wildlife obviously live in these beautiful patches of green. So the best way to do that is to partner religion and science something that most people say, oh, that's not possible, they don't go together, but I think they kind of do because this head priest wants to save all of God's creatures. And I, as a resident biologist over in Ethiopia, want to protect biodiversity. So we have come together and created a very special partnership. And the solution here is twofold. One is to educate the priests with workshops because they don't have Google Earth images. They don't have computers to look up any kind of biological information. They don't even have a library to look up biology texts to find out some different principles about ecosystems. And so we really need to help them understand the value of their remaining trees and the fact that no other trees exist outside of their church forests. And so after they learned that of their own volition, they said, wow, we could build walls using the local stone and we could protect these amazing genetic libraries. So lo and behold, we now have an incredible local wall building program for conservation walls around the church forests in Ethiopia. And if you go over today to Bahir Dar or Lake Tana, you'll hopefully see some of these amazing walls built by local people because they're so dedicated to saving their forests and their biodiversity. And Tree Foundation funds these walls. They're very inexpensive based on American standards, $6 a cubic meter. But um, we have our biggest donors as fifth and sixth graders, kids who see these pictures on our website or hear me give a Zoom talk to their school and say, holy cow, I'd like to give my lunch money to help the kids in Ethiopia. So it's a great example of how kids understand the global sustainability issues, sometimes maybe more than adults do. And so in the end, all of these conservation issues to save our big trees, our most important forests, do depend on local relationships. And we can engage women as conservation stewards. That's my underlying aim at the same time as we can hopefully save the forests and save the biodiversity in them. Um, our priorities for Mission Green are, of course, to trial new education activities in our Florida 
uh, walkway. We have some grants pending with some of the local foundations to use webcams and VR and a few other technologies out there that we might be able to share so that people can visit canopy walkways all around the world from their homes. Uh, we want, we've just hired an educator in a partnership with the University of Florida to uh, train local families. She's a lovely girl that I met when she was in fifth grade working down in Peru and she grew up in an indigenous village in the Amazon, has had a scholarship to finish her PhD on women and conservation and now will be our first hire with Mission Green to go back home and educate the local women and families to work on the canopy walkway that we've already built there. Uh, meantime, we're going to Madagascar in April with Pat Wright, the lemur lady, to design a walkway in that country where less than 4% of the forest is remaining. So it's a really critical issue to get Madagascar uh, jump started with some education and forest conservation through our canopy walkways. And a program is pending in India where very few urban kids ever get into the forests. And we really are excited about collaborating there with some pretty big corporate sponsors to build a walkway in the Western Ghats. Um, so how is all this going to happen? Well, it has to be $10 million in 10 years. It's a real emergency for our forests. And it's so fabulous that people all over the world are planting trees now. In fact, Ethiopia had a tree planting day last year and planted 350 million trees in one day. But of course, only about one in a hundred survive and no koala can live on a seedling. It usually takes a hundred years or more for a tree to grow big enough to support the biodiversity of the forest that was cut down or burned or cleared. So we do know the priority here is saving big trees at all costs and Hopefully that will do so much to ameliorate climate change, as well as to give our kids a better chance at preserving the genetic library that they really can't live without. Um, so with that, I want you to think hard about saving big trees in your community as well as around the world by educating your kids, by sharing information with schools, by reading books about forests, by contributing to organizations that save big trees and maybe participating in ecotourism. I hope you might take your kids to visit a canopy walkway more than you will go to Disney World on the weekend. One preserves big trees and the other preserves plastic trees. So it's up to you to make that choice. And uh, with that, I will perhaps turn it back to Lisa so we have time for a couple questions before that drop dead timeline. Um, I know we were a little behind, so I did my best to talk fast so that maybe we could catch up. Um, thank you so much for listening and I'm really honored to be part of this day. Great work, all of you, the team that provided and created this wonderful activity for Sarasota. Thank you again. So great, so great. Thank you, Meg, much appreciated. Um, I'm thinking of E.O. Wilson, and I think of him, oddly enough, almost every day because of his work with the ants. I, you know, and I get reductive and I think of people as ants and it's a horrible worldview, but uh, it, it's it's just stayed with me for years. Um, so um, people who have comments, you can put them in the comment line. I see one from Marianne um, who says uh, she wants to know if Suzanne Simard, who's author of Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest, uh, is working with you on Mission Green. Yeah, great question. I know Suzanne well. She, of course, works under the trees. And um, so, and we are working at the top of the tree, so we couldn't be farther apart. And her mission might be to save the roots and the soil. And we're working on most of the biodiversity lives in the top of the tree. So we're pretty much at a, about a 200 feet away from Suzanne. Nothing wrong with that, but just slightly different missions. And you know how scientists get a little more focused. So she is not part of our team, but Wade Davis is a professor at University of British Columbia that works all with all of the First Nations up there in fabulous fabulous ways. And he also works in the Amazon and he's on our advisory board and we'll be working on a walkway up in British Columbia because even that forest is worthy of a hot spot. It's not the most biodiversity in the world, but it's a very, very special area of forests. So we're excited to have Wade, who is a colleague of Suzanne's. Thanks for that question. 
So um, Amber mentioned uh, a hope spot in Dunedin um, and not a question. She just mentioned that that um, is, is exists in our area. I'm wondering um, if you can comment on what behaviors help contribute to higher bi biodiversity or what factors contribute yeah. to that? Great question. Well, of course, like everything else, the more little spaces you have, the more tiny little niches, say in a forest structure, the more species will live there. So that's why bigger trees contribute to higher biodiversity. They'll have moss on the branches and they'll have shade branches and sun branches and big leaves at the bottom and small leaves at the top and different chemistry throughout the tree. So it's almost like having the biggest penthouse in the world where you have more people living in that apartment block than you do having people mm -hmm. live in a very tiny apartment block that's only two stories high with two boxes that all look the same. So it's all about that sophistication and diversity of the structure of the forest that develops with your older trees and your bigger forests. So the more you have more physical spaces, the more species can live there. And then the more things that come to eat those species and the more things that come to eat those species. So it's kind of a wonderful web of life. Yeah, and Elizabeth has a question on, you know, what is below the surface. Um, she's saying, if we included the root system of trees, would that 50% of all biology be even higher, um, which is in the canopy alone, she asks. Absolutely. And that's a great thought, Elizabeth. I did work on that underground component before probably Suzanne was born. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, I worked on mycorrhizae in Australia. And of course, there's a lot of bacteria there and fungal components. And much of that has not been identified. And most of that doesn't have specialists working on identifying them per se. So there will be a great addition to more biodiversity. Nothing like probably the insects that we see in the canopy in the millions and millions, but certainly a, a bigger addition. So again, saving the whole forest is so important and not just maybe cutting it down and saving the soil or, you know, trying to worry about the top, but not the bottom. It is its whole system that's so important. Yeah, and Anne has a question, and this kind of gets back to where you were talking about those small spaces. We have seen some, you know, what are referred to as invasive species come and dominate some of those smaller spaces. So Anne asks if you can talk about the importance of having native trees and plants, um, not exotics like many right. places have in Florida. Hugely critical, and I'm embarrassed to admit because I'm a former botanical garden director. Fifty percent of invasive plants have escaped out of botanical gardens. So Oops. we've got to start thinking about how can we really cultivate natives and prioritize natives because exotic or invasive species don't support our local biodiversity as well as native species. The native species obviously are that piece of the food web that's so important. Um, and I have also worked on eucalypts all around the world. And we all know the case study there. They're fantastic in Australia for koalas and, you know, different kinds of beetles and all sorts of fly larvae that love them to death. But when you get them in another country, A, they don't have their normal predators. So they grow fast and take over and B, they live on fire. They need fire to produce and reproduce their seed expansion, their seeds burst during fire. And we have watched California burn in many cases because they planted eucalypts as a short-term canopy solution. So we've got to be so careful about not getting carried away with these fast growing exotics because they do wreak havoc on the landscape. And they definitely don't usually support as many native wildlife as the local species do. Um, Aliyah wants to know what happens at the canopy? You know, how is it different from the uh, other parts of the tree? What happens at the canopy and not other parts yeah. of the tree? Very cool question. And thanks for reminding me to say this. But when you hear this, you'll go, oh my gosh, it's what I call hit you over the head science. Because no foresters figured this out until a couple of us climbed a tree in 1979. But that's where the sun hits the tree. It's where all the fruits and flowers are maximized. When you think about it, of course, the fruits are at 
at the top of the tree where the sunlight hits and the best photosynthesis at the top of the tree where the sunlight hits. And so therefore all the animals at the top of the tree because that's where the energy is being exuded and that's where the tree has all this amazing productivity. So if you're a beetle or a bird, you're gonna hang out at the top of the tree. And if you eat the beetle or the bird, you're gonna hang out at the top of the tree. So it literally is the hot spot of the forest for life. And once you think about that sun and water hitting the canopy first, you say, oh my gosh, but of course. And for over 200 years, foresters only cut trees down. So they never saw the biodiversity because usually it was either squished or flew away. And it wasn't till we passively climbed the trees that we saw what was up there. Yeah, a lot of us get um, overwhelmed when we hear about the enormity of some of these social problems. Or, or uh, And Stephen um, wants to know, what's the one thing that I can personally do today or tomorrow in our community to make a difference or have an impact? Right, great. Well, why don't you make a nature trail and visit the big trees and take kids with you? You can put it online or you could make a brochure or invite the schools. I mean, don't just plant trees. It's great to go to a school and plant trees and nothing is wrong with that, but talk about the big trees and where the seeds came from and maybe let kids visit a big tree and let them touch it and hug it. And maybe they could have journals and they could look at the seasons and when do the birds nest? When does the eagle come in and build its nest? When do the owls hoot at the top? You know, there's so much that kids could do with a big tree. And obviously at, at a policy level, protecting those big trees becomes easier easier when you get the whole community loving and appreciating the big trees and saving a patch of trees is even better than a single tree, of course. So you've, if you can boost the education of people to appreciate their big trees, that would be fantastic. Yeah, get out walking children in nature. Um, but Elena has a, a, an adjunct to that. She says, uh, besides trying to save trees, planting new trees, and um, you know that appeals to me, but what's the best organization or group that I should contribute money to that will plant more trees? Right. Well, there are a lot of planting tree groups. There's one called Plant with Purpose based in San Diego that partners with me in developing countries, which I really appreciate because they're the ones that can least afford it. Um, our tree foundation locally doesn't do tree planting because so many groups do, lots of churches do, for example. And we do make a point of trying to help save big trees and educate kids about big trees. So if you like that, we're always so happy to get your support. But if you do want to plant trees, then you need to be careful and look for one that does do that and doesn't filter the money with lots of different church events and other things. Nothing wrong with that, but I think you want to focus your money where you would like your check to go. Right. Um, Aliyah is wondering how you make the decision which tree in a forest that you're going to study. Ah, great question. You got to read my book. I, I tried to talk about how do scientists make these decisions? It's so incredible. And let's face it, a little bit of it is a lottery, but um, I loved studying figs. I climbed so many figs in my life. And sometimes in India, there's only one fig. It's the cultural, spiritual tree in the middle of the village. But in other forests, it's surrounded by a thousand other species and I have to go in there and find it. So there are many different questions that scientists ask. And so always that would dictate what tree I would climb, but a little bit of its safety too. Let's be honest. You can't climb a tree that's full of termites or you're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> and um, I'm just reading the ones that have questions attached to them. Um, there are some great comments here in the thread, and I know people can go back and, and sort of absorb some of those. Um, Erica is asking, how can young kids get involved in a way that makes them feel like they're making a real difference for the tree and canopy life right here in our community? Right. That's so great. And, you know, I've had so many kids over the years do amazing projects, everything from going to Mayaka with their families and making drawings of what insects are eating the leaves or looking at the health of the trees or maybe taking a few pictures at different times of year. Um, other kids uh, can learn a little bit about trees and maybe talk to younger kids, go into preschools or kindergartens. Kids need to know about trees and almost no young kid is uh, 
too young to teach another kid or teach a younger kid. So I would really, uh, you know, think that kids need to do that. What about making a little map of trees in your neighborhood? What about asking your mayor, heaven forbid, but kids have a great voice, say, you know, what are the biggest trees in our community and are you working on saving them? And the adults might be a little embarrassed that they don't even know that, but I think raising that attention is important. And then the other big thing is, uh, trees far away from us get cut down because we buy the wrong things. And that's a little more complex. But hmm. for young kids, if you can be really careful, if your parents are buying timber, make sure they're buying a local pine and not buying some exotic rosewood from the Amazon. I think there are a lot of basic things that kids can ask questions and ask for answers, which is important. Uh, Aaliyah wants to know, what are some of the most unexpected research findings that you've <laughs> come across? Well, the first one was that all the biodiversity is at the top of the tree. I had no idea when I first climbed a tree and nobody did, no one else did either. So that was extraordinary to, to have all those foresters spending millions of dollars over decades and decades and none of them ever went to the top of a tree. So that was kind of like a childhood dream to make such a discovery. But then once we were up there, we found out that you know what bugs eat about 25 percent of a canopy every year and it doesn't hurt most trees so we found out that insects are a bigger part of defoliation and it's not a bad thing it's actually keeps the tree growing and keeps it fitter in a funny way and then the other thing that of course is extraordinary is that so many many things live up there and so many are little like water bears and little tiny caterpillars mm -hmm. and things that we probably don't appreciate until we get up close and personal with our trees uh Diane has three questions that are kind of asking the same thing. Uh, she starts by saying, I thought that biodiversity increases as we get closer and closer to the equator. Does this apply to the canopy as well? And also bigger trees closer to the equator have more diversity question, or is closeness to the equator irrelevant as far as biodiversity and big trees? No, absolutely true. Thank you, Diane. Closer to the equator, we have the highest biodiversity for sure. So our biggest trees up in Alaska don't have nearly the biodiversity of a big tree down in Peru, but a big tree in Alaska will have more biodiversity than a little tiny sapling in Alaska, if you follow me there. Mm -hmm. But the biggest homes for biodiversity that we know scientifically tend to be closer to the equator, which is why our program Mission Green is starting out with Madagascar, Mozambique, the Amazon, Malaysia, these countries that are equatorial that house this extraordinary amount of biodiversity and tend to often be the countries that can't afford themselves to protect it as can Americans. So they need our help in that sense. But you're absolutely right. Closer to the equator, more diversity. But if you have, if you clear down in Peru in the Amazon and then you plant little seedlings, you won't have that high biodiversity. You need the big trees to house that high biodiversity. So you need two things, tropical climate, if you wanna maximize diversity in big trees. But if you don't live in the tropics, you still wanna take care of your local biodiversity with redwoods or with big maple trees, or in the case of Florida, big live oak trees are fabulous resources for biodiversity. Um, Aaliyah is looking for some cautionary advice. Uh, she's wondering if you have any thoughts to follow for wildlife advocates um, that you might offer yourself if you could go back in time and do it over again. If I could do it over again, I would have been much more aggressive and strong. I, as a woman in science, I was usually the only girl on every expedition and I did my fair share of dishwashing and food preparation because that was the role, you know, and plus my science. And I think I should have been screaming and yelling and saying, we've got to do more than just count species or measure trees. We've got to be saving trees. And I've really become a conservation biologist later in my career because unfortunately academics reward you to publish the data, to make the list and publish the data, but they never promote you if you've saved the forest. So it's a crazy thing where we need provosts and college presidents to stand up and say, let's change the metrics of success for science. And if I could go back in time and become that college president and create an institution that had those metrics of conservation, I would be, be very proud. 
Yeah, systemic change, another call there, and that seems to be a common theme today. Um, there are a bunch of comments that offer some resources. Um, uh, there, I see questions further down. I am going to mention this one comment, though, from Jack, who says there's a celery fields field trip tomorrow that will include a tree trail walk through the planted forest and discuss benefits. So that may be something people want to hop on. Fantastic. Great stuff. Uh, yeah, um, we got some book list suggestions. Um, there is a question from uh, Coffee who says, why are pines not among our grand tree categories in Florida? Well, actually some are. We had a grand pine uh, on the campus at New College and I was part of a group when I was a professor there where we uh, cloned it for some uh, resource group up in Michigan that was trying to keep a genetic library of all the oldest trees in North America. So there are a few, I don't know if publicly they're part of like a state grand tree category, but I know that nationally they are very, very much appreciated. And even if they're not on somebody's list, you can make your own grand tree and you can protect it yourself because there are some magnificent trees that go under the radar. So I hope you're out there. Those tree pine trees are fabulous. Fabulous. We're getting a lot of uh, book suggestions and, and just a lot of people who are grateful for this exchange this afternoon. Um, I'm not seeing oh, great. more questions, but I can go back. Jennifer uh, wants to remind people that Keep Manatee beautiful sponsors all the Arbor Day events for Manatee County Cities, and we also run the Tree City USA programs. Right. Well, you know what? I, this is so embarrassing, but at 245, I'm supposed to talk to 300 fifth graders in oh, Illinois. Right. And because through the Tree Foundation, because we're the tree group for the whole country, we get all these invitations from kids, teachers to talk about trees. And so I did a little bit of a double booking. So I'm going to, I'm going to give up on the adults here and go talk to the kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, it timed That's, out perfectly. So I think it did. I'm so grateful. And I hate to shortchange anyone's questions, but you can always find me through the Tree Foundation or anywhere in town. I'm sure that Lisa and Sophie can track me down. I'm just always so happy to talk about trees and maybe give some presentations for our local schools too, because we love kids to learn about trees. Awesome. Thank you so much, Meg, for inspiring us and uh, sharing your fascinating work.